Straw Hut Media. Hello on the Rockers. We're going to have a very good time and get mighty legendary with our Spill the Tea session with RuPaul's Drag Race alum and drag superstar Honey Davenport with my guest co-host today, horror film guru and editor-in-chief of Bear World Magazine, John Hernandez, and me, your favorite host with the sassy most. Raise a glass and let the drinks begin. It's on the rocks. <laughs> Life is a banquet, and most poor suckers are starving to death. I'd like to propose a toast. This is On the Rocks with Alexander, where I drink with your favorite celebrities as we talk about fashion, entertainment, pop culture, reality TV, and, well, that's about it. So pop a cork, lean back, and raise a glass to On the Rocks. Ooh, buns and bows and pantyhose on the Rocks podcast, a place where we're too glam to give a damn. Why, oh, why do I continue to watch The Real Housewives of Anything? It's an addiction. I keep saying no more, no more, and there I am until 2 a.m. watching. Did you hear the news? Um, OC yeah. Housewife. How dare you? OC Housewife Shannon Bedore got arrested for a DUI after being a complete mess on the current season. And then in real life, she's doing it. Allegedly, we have to say allegedly, she hasn't been to court yet. She smashed into a house in Newport Beach, fled the scene just far enough, then got out of her car, took her dog out of the back seat, and started walking her dog around drunk. Um, allegedly. So it would seem that it couldn't have been her that smashed into the house because she was busy walking her dog in a different neighborhood. <laughs> Uh, animal services are literally looking into it. Uh, girl, what is wrong with you? Leave the dog out of it. Take an Uber with all your Bravo money. I don't have Bravo money and I Uber every way. Uh, girl, I still watching the housewives. Uh, find us on Instagram and TikTok at On The Rocks on Air and on Facebook on The Rocks Radio Show. Send me an email. Book me for a pride, wedding, funeral, quinceanera, bris. I don't care. I'll be there and MC. Also send us your comments, guest requests, and your guest questions. We, we got some burning questions today. Uh, info at On The Rocks Radio show.com. The show is presented by Straw Hut Media. You can watch and listen to our over now 300 episodes at on the rocks radio show.com. We tape the show at UBN Go Studios in the heart of Burbank. You can watch us on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV on the Outed.tv app, Facebook Watch, streaming with pride on SVTV and on Channel 31 on the East Coast. Lucky you, East Coast. All right, let's get the show on the road. My co host today, hot off the plane from New York, John Hernandez, is the editor in chief of Bear World Magazine. And in, d- in addition to Bear Culture, he specializes in entertainment entertainment writing with a special focus on horror and genre films. He's also the creator of the first gay bear horror host. Say that three times fast. Gay bear horror host, Stan the Mechanic, (laughs) which is our gay bear version of Elvira. We're going to talk more about that. Please welcome John Hernandez. Now, are you, like, really a Hernandez? Like, you have Latino culture? Absolutely. I'm here Puerto Rican, honey. Which half? The top or the bottom half? The top half. Ooh. Gucci, gucci, go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you got that Puerto Rican flair in the bear community flair. Like, you got a little bit of everything. Oh, yeah. You know, hot-tempered, hot and furry, mm-hmm. all that good stuff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Some of my favorite things. Um, and you are the new editor-in-chief uh, at Bear World Magazine, which is a magazine for the bear community um, and their admirers. Right. Um, and it's been around for a while. Uh, how does it feel to take on this like <laughs> this mega brand? Um, <clears throat> it's a great honor. I've been working with them for over eight years at this point. So I was kind of in on the ground floor and uh, I slept my way to the top. I mean, <laughs> uh, my husband, Richard, is the, the founder of it. So uh, but we've been working together on it for almost a decade. And I took over in March and we just celebrated 11 years at uh, Bear World. <laughs> Congratulations, congratulations. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, we have a picture of your first cover that, that you did uh, for the magazine. Um, now, I want to ask you, with our current focus on body positivity, inclusivity, etc., there, there's your first cover as editor-in-chief. Right. Um, <laughs> You know, all of this talk about body positivity. How is that affecting the bear community and your magazine? Is it bringing more people or is it kind of diluting it? Because now we're all celebrating bigger bodies on all different platforms. We don't need a genre specific. I think it's bringing more people to the party. Absolutely. And um, in fact, we were kind of having to circle back to make sure all of our lovely muscle bears know that they're welcome in the community too Mm -hmm. and uh we do a lot of focus to make sure uh we feature uh bears of color trans bears we try to be very uh diverse and inclusive because uh as much as i love the bear community they have their issues and we address that at the magazine because that's what we believe in so 
I, I love that. Um, I, in the past, have been asked to MC a number of bear uh, events. Um, I don't really, like, I'm always in a boat tie and I'm always like, you know, whatever. And so I've had my issues and I haven't felt that welcomed because it's like, well, you're not our bear. You're not, you know, jumping in the pool with no clothes on and you don't have like the leather harness. Like, I don't own anything leather except my wallet. <laughs> so I was like, you know, but I have sometimes felt not so it included. But I feel that that's definitely changed. I'm talking about this was like 10 years ago. This has definitely changed. And we're seeing now bears, even like in mainstream pride stuff where it used to be, okay, this is your bear event. Bears go play over there. There. Twinks go play over there. Now everybody's kind of playing on o- open fields. Yeah, I I agree, and I love to see it. In fact, the bear community. I was just at a World Bear Weekend. Shout out this last weekend in Orlando, Florida, and there are mama bears, and there's a very big move to welcome in like the pet community. So there were, you know, uh, cis women competing, and um, you know, our trans siblings were competing for titles, and um, they've been enveloped into the bear community, and that's. It's beautiful. The more the merrier. It it was a community that was founded because we didn't feel like we fit into the mainstream, you know, gay body type and physicality and culture. And then for for us as a community to turn around and try to exclude people is bullshit, frankly. So yeah. um, so I'm glad that that's all changing. It's a sign of the times. Well, congratulations. <clears throat> Can't wait to see what uh, you're going to be doing with the magazine. OK, who the hell is Stan the Mechanic? That's like your alter ego. Yes. Like, uh, who is that? What's going on? That's the Superman to my Clark Kent. Uh, he, he he is the one and only satanic mechanic. He is a horror host that I invented during the pandemic. Uh, he kept me busy. Uh, based Basically, the story is, you know, he's got a workshop in Brooklyn and it's under the guise of being a mechanic shop. But really, you know, he just hangs out with all the demons in the paranormal community and watches some horror movies and gives some stupid trivia and, you know, some slutty, sexy gags. Because, you know, it's uh, what makes him a bit different is like where Elvira, you know, they flirt with the line uh, to take a line from Bianca Del Rio. Stan crosses it and then snorts it. That's kind (laughs) of... I love when people at parties ask me, would you like to do coke? It's like, bitch, does that look like I do coke? I mean, come on. <laughs> but I love it because you're doing that vein, like like vamp- Vampira and then Elvira. Like, I love that. That was a culture that I just love because it's super gay. Um, but then we get, you know, to delve into the horror genre, which has so much history and it's so rich of, uh, you know, goodness. Oh, yeah. And it's super queer. Like, they just yep. did a uh, documentary, Queer for Fear. And they trace the roots. So, you know, the gothic horror is all written by queers and Frankenstein. Mary Shelley was a big old queer. Yep. And, um, you know, Bram Stoker, it's rumored that he was also, you know, bi at the very least. So we've been there since the beginning. And it's definitely a big queer community that just, you know, loves the dark side of things. You know, mm-hmm. nothing mm-hmm. wrong with that. Yeah. Now, how did your fascination with horror start? Were you like a little kid and you watched your first... Yeah, yeah. like I remember, <clears throat> and not to get all sad, sappy about it, but, you know, me and my dad didn't have many things that we bonded over. But one thing that he really did enjoy when I was a kid was uh, Halloween, and he took me and my brother trick-or-treating a lot. And so that I think that's really what spurned it forward. And, um, yeah, you know, I just I remember watching them on VHS. You know, we used to record them, like, <laughs> off the TV, you know, um, back in the day, back in the 80s. Uh and I just loved it. I love that feeling. And you just chase that high of getting scared like that for the rest of your life. That's kind of what we all are. We're horror junkies. In that uh, 100%. We're going to talk horror films with Honey, by the way. We're going to pick our, our <laughs> favorite horror films and, and the queerest. Um, if you were to uh, be able to say something to Jamie Lee Curtis, what would you say? I would thank her, number one, uh, which sounds trite and boring, but it, it really is true. Like, you you have your heroes out there and it goes beyond her just being the star of my favorite scary movie. She's used her platform in such ways that it's so inspiring. She's talk about an ally for the queer community. Her, her daughter is trans. She's out there on the uh, the front line for us. Um, and, she, you know, she does a lot of work with Children's Hospital LA. Like, yep. she's out there, you know, with the SAG actors, like I, you know, and with I, her debit card, by the way. Yeah, I, you know, so she uh, puts her money where her mouth is, and I appreciate and respect that. So I would thank her for her integrity and for remembering us when she made her freaking Oscar, Oscars acceptance yep. speech. She remembered the genre fans, which no other bitch in Hollywood is going to remember us. So. 
Big I love props that. to Jamie Lee Curtis. <laughs> we love you, Jamie Lee. Um, are you ready? Are you ready for for the lady of the hour? So ready. <laughs> All right. Please welcome Honey Davenport. With over a decade of experience in the entertainment industry, James Heath Clark, a.k.a. Honey Davenport, has left an indelible mark on the New York City nightlife scene and beyond, touring the world as a singer, dancer, actor, drag superstar, and club DJ. They are recording artists and vocal activists whose music speaks to the experiences of the oppressed, calling for social injustice and equality for all, and that's not something new. We're going to talk about her childhood and how this all came out. Uh, Davenport holds 18 pageant crowns, six glam awards, and a 2020 Giant Fest Award for Music Artists of the Year. Also, zero tolerance for discrimination. Hey, girl. Uh, since appearing on season 11 of RuPaul's Drag Race, they have released nine singles, and their latest EP, Love is God, features appearances from Mel- Melinda Luzon and Jackie Cox, uh, and Kevin Aviance. Additionally, they've appeared as a guest panelist on VH1's Black Girl Beauty, will appear in the upcoming feature, God Save the Queens, and during the pandemic when we we're all depressed, her digital content was featured in Rolling Stone, Pink News, and Billboard, who called them a practical master class. With ass, by the way. That's what I added. So you can put on the rocks added that um p.s off-broadway theater credits include leading roles in electric highway and trinkets as well as a major role in the orion experience which mixes sci-fi with a little drama we're gonna talk about that as well uh they also performed in the broadway national tour of hairspray fresh out of college i wonder what shenanigans uh came out from that new york magazine has called davenport one of the top 100 most powerful drag queens in america paper magazine called them a new york icon and rupaul's drag race declared davenport legendary this week her collab with mr your online prep uh, resource by the way and alaska titled Mighty Legendary hit the media waves let's take a little look at Mighty Legendary I'm very I'm very legendary I'm better than the rest and all these girls would never test me I'm very very I'm mighty legendary you try but you can't bless me crown on my head is heavy And you can find a few of our past on the rock friends in the background, Dakota Payne. Hey, girl. Uh, please welcome Honey James Heath Clark Davenport. Hey. <laughs> Okay, before we get into drag and your career, P.S., I'm really excited about this because we're drinking vodka and I know you're very outspoken and you're very honest. So we, okay. we got a show for you today. I'm going to talk about your early days, though. Born and raised in West Philadelphia, you've talked about growing up in the projects. Uh, that is a far cry from the runway. Mm-hmm. Talk about what it was like growing up, where you did, and some of the themes that you had to deal with as a kid early on where the rest of us are like, what? Right? Yeah. <laughs> I think as a kid, we're all like, what? Right? We're all trying to... to figure out our place in this world. And I think that nowadays uh, we have put a lot of things in place to affirm kids in a way that didn't exist when I was younger. Uh, and that conversation is created. I, I remember growing up in West Philadelphia feeling very different than everybody that, you know, I had a, a family who loved me. Uh, I had friends, um, but I just always felt so strange. Um, uh, I, I, I didn't identify as non-binary growing up. And I think that played a huge role on that because I never felt like a male or female. I just felt foreign. And we never had that language. Like, yeah. how exciting is it now? Kids have a language to be like, this is, this is what I feel like. Yeah. This is what I feel. This is who I feel that I am, you know? And, you know, I, I was just having this conversation on the way here with a trans sister of mine. Um, and, you know, you, a trans journey really starts mentally. A, a transition is really a, is mental, you know, uh, and non-binary people are just as trans as a trans woman or a trans man. You know, if we don't include non-binary people on the trans spectrum, then we're also kind of saying like Marsha P. Donson wasn't trans in a way because same, like you know, Um and you were dealing with all these kind of issues while there's like gun warfare and there's like death a- around you. Like, this is what you had to do as a kid. Like, when I was a kid, if our Disney Channel cut off, like, I was really depressed. Like, that's what I was going through. Yeah. I mean, it, I mean, I grew up in a hood as fuck area, <laughs> which I'm super proud of. And I'm, I'm super grateful that I came from that. I think it's made me into who I am. Kind of give you a thick skin. You know, I gave me a lot of thick things. Okay. Oh, oh, oh right. okay. <laughs> West Philadelphia. That's my next. <laughs> 
bucket you know, list. <laughs> it's a good, I wouldn't last 10 minutes. <laughs> I mean, or would you? Mm. Mm. <laughs> that was fresh. But, but yeah, uh, there just like there wasn't a lot of conversation or people to affirm my feelings uh, about who, who I am or, and who I was. And it, it definitely led me down a road of uh, insecurities. And um, I remember when I first moved to New York, I moved to New York at 18 and I just felt the ability to be queer for the first time you know it's and like when dorothy opens up the door and it's all color and it's like a whole new world <laughs> can't you feel the brand new day like, <laughs> <laughs> yes, the wizard's coming back to broadway i'm shitting my pants oh my gosh and i just auditioned right here <laughs> uh, 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 right right that was my audition call me yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> right? but, but and blessed. <laughs> i actually just uh was in new york doing a workshop for a new broadway musical um i and, heard through the grapevine uh-huh, that's what you were doing uh-huh, uh-huh. And I and I've been talking with my original theater agent, who's represented me since I was 21 years old. Wow! wow. Yesterday, uh, <laughs> right? I know, A year's but, gone by, you know, <laughs> right? And um, and uh, she was uh, just been over the moon at my like kind of return to musical theater, which I didn't think that I left, but I definitely put more of my focus on drag and creating my own music and my own like lane for sure. So yeah. We're going to talk about your musical theater past and, and, and college, but you also grew up with these facets of what we would call masculine versus feminine. Mm-hmm. Um, and I will talk about how this plays a, a place in the bear community as well. You boxed when you were a kid. That was one of your mm-hmm. hobbies. You were in junior ROTC, mm-hmm. which if you know anybody that was in ROTC, it was like, man, man, man. <laughs> but you also did spoken word. You were in the church choir. You were writing music very early on, uh, which is more creative side. With what society was teaching us, how you grow up to be a boy, especially in the kind of environment you are in, you know, or were in in the projects, it's like, this is what a man looks like. This is what a boy looks like. You kind of had these two worlds that were colliding. How did you deal with that? And how did that play a part in your coming out? I think that growing up, I was a part of so many things because I was trying to figure out who I am, who I, who I was, you know, so I was like, try everything until something sticks. But the, the thing about me is that I'm like committed when I'm in it, I'm in it. And, I'm and you gonna, make it work. Right. You know, yeah. so I would keep, you know, in my yearbook, I remember I was like in like every club picture. I was in like the band club and the yearbook club and I was vice president and also homecoming king and prom king. Were wow. you really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You bitch. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was, I, I was, was like in chess club in the corner of the picture. I'm like, <laughs> If we had a chess club, I would have been in that too. Um, I've been the queen. Okay, right. I was. I, I was. I was trying to uh, uh, figure out who I was, and especially with the ROTC stuff. Um, when I was, that's a tough community because they're for real. Even junior ROTC, I remember they were the kids that you. They were for real, and I wasn't just like in ROTC. I was like. A commander of my uh, squadron. Um, so, I mean, these really butch guys were taking commands for me and I was already super me. <laughs> <laughs> Practice for the future. I was right. just going to say, some things don't change. Okay. Dominatrix Davenport. <laughs> uh, so, so th- yeah, my life has always had that like kind of juxtaposition of, of both things. Uh, it, it was really a path of self-discovery and, uh, and trying so many things. It's really created who I am today, you know? Well, and when you look at all the, uh, y- okay, you're an actor, comma, singer, comma, music writer, comma, spoke, you know, uh, you know, it's all of these adjectives, and it's because you're able to do that. And we know now in the entertainment industry, you can't just do that one thing. Mm, Judy Garland no. today would be like, "I gotta do social media." Oh my god, I don't have to do. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like right. you have to be a master of all trades. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I would talk about the bear community because we know the early years of the bear community. It was like big brass and beautiful, but it was beards and it was hair. Um, has that kind of changed with the non-binary community becoming? I know you said like contestants are now changing, but the community as a whole, are we? Are we appreciating the feminine side of being a bear? We're making moves. I wouldn't say it's perfect. There's still a lot of issues around, um, you know, uh, the old regime still prefers Mm -hmm. hyper-masculinity. But I do see a lot more bears out there, you know, painting their nails, um, using non-binary they, them pronouns. Mm -hmm. Um, One of my closest friends is non-binary. And they went out to Bear Week concerned in p-town or whatever and they were embraced there, there is more of it you know there, there's a long way to go but uh 
you know, we're making strides, you know. <laughs> I think as long as we're communicating and sharing our stories, I think sometimes we're so afraid to ask questions. You know, non-binary to somebody like me who came out when it was like, you're either gay or straight. And if you said you were bi, people laughed. You're like, uh uh-huh, you're gay. We're just going to wait a few years, mm-hmm. right? Right. And we didn't have this kind of language. That's my generation. So to grasp it is very new for me. But it's like I should be able to ask questions from my own community what's this what's that you know and it's like uh, I had a, a a trans friend who said I am so tired of having to educate people when they ask me questions about being trans I'm like that's kind of our role as the LGBTQ community. We should take every opportunity to share our story and to educate people yeah. in a positive way you know of course it's exhausting but that's our duty that's if we want change to, to happen um, okay we'll talk about your your first exposure to Jag your first time seeing it was it when you were a kid was it you know a skit on SNL what what was that I mean we all grew up watching like Bugs Bunny right yep. talk <laughs> uh, about the biggest homo yes. if anybody was a homo mm-hmm. what's up talk always the carrot come on she was a good drag queen she yes, was, she was. Uh, <laughs> and so well celebrated too. right right um but the very first drag queen I ever saw perform was actually a New York City nightlife legend, Shaquita. Uh, she was performing in Philadelphia at the Philadelphia French Festival. She was singing opera. And uh, yeah, she's in, an incredible New York City performer, uh, a legend uh, in, in her own right. Um, and yeah, but I was I was taken under the wing of uh, New York City nightlife legend Peppermint. And yes. that was when I really got Backup exposed. Backup dancer. Yeah. I was dancing in a nightclub one night and Pep came over to me and was like, hey, do you want to perform with me at Lincoln Center? And I was like, what? Wow. Yeah. You're like, bucket list, check. I mean, let's go. Yeah. And so I went to rehearsals with Pep and I started dancing for her. And then she took me literally all over the world. She took me to London and Dublin and Berlin and Sydney. Before she was on Drag Race, she was already a huge drag superstar. And um, I always joke with her that like I rode the peppermint train into drag because like my life a- as it is and how fast it was for me to make a name for myself in New York City was really because of peppermint taking me under her wing. Even even with as much contri- contribution as I have for my drag family, the Davenports, right. peppermint is is a mother to me. You know? And you also worked with, with, with Sherry Vine when we talk about people who have really laid the roots for drag um, and peppermint with, you know, with the trans community. Mm-hmm. Um, this is our community that's supposed to be supporting our community, not worried about, God, honey's going to take the spotlight away from me. I mean, look at, look at her go. It's like support, support, support. Let's grow because if we all succeed, we all succeed. Right. I think that the thing about that is when you are from a community who's space has been limited in the world and you get a little piece of it you hold on to that and you fight for that and you think that if anybody else a good point gets a, a second of that it might diminish yours and the reality is that 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 success is only because of the people before us mm-hmm. who created space for us uh, and there's some really legendary queens like Sherry and Pep who've just continually created space for a new generation of drag and that's really one of my favorite things about drag honestly is that when I started drag there wasn't like you could find how to do your makeup on YouTube and like people was weren't none of that there was none of that you had to go and you had to sit in the dressing room at Escalita while Sahara <laughs> Davenport painted her face <laughs> as she yelled at you about how you were awful at this until you got it you know like that it was a passed down art form I think the last art form passed down art form because now you can you can go to college and there's college courses on drag race by the way 100%. like you know like 100% just it's become it's a, part of TV history now yeah yeah, it's become a legitimate platform for art now, just like playing the flute, you know, and I think that's because of the doors and the space that have been continually uh, like thrown open. And I think that the the more success we get, the more it, if we continually do that more, we'll, we'll see it in even further heights. Let's go back just a little bit, because like you said, you moved to New York at 18. You studied at EMDA mm-hmm. uh, Musical Theater. Was that transition to New York hard at all? Oh my god, it was terrifying. Um, it was it was terrifying for the first like two nights, and then I realized two that, nights. Like, <laughs> people are like, my first two years were rough. I no. ate forty years. You're no, like was, two nights. There was like two nights and until then my I, grinder got synced, and we were fine. <laughs> hello, hello. <laughs> and then I realized I had this like hot, very really hung guy across the hall from me in my dorms, and I was like, I'm safe. Um, <laughs> you like came home with your booty out. Hey, okay, I lost my key again. <laughs> right. Um, but the first couple of nights in New York for real were like just a weird adjustment. I remember when my 
my mom and my uncle, rest in peace, he just passed away, pulled off to, from dropping me off. Uh, I just sobbed the entire yeah. night. Like I just was so terrified and so nervous. And then I realized I lived in a city. I could walk around in like a hot pink shirt and my tights and nobody judged me. And I was like, oh, fuck. Yeah. They probably didn't I'm even good. notice. They're like, oh, OK. And they're like, you know, whatever. Like, I got out shit to do. <laughs> just, just move past my way, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know where you grew up uh born and raised in new york but it's so, you know that's I'm, the accent i'm oh yeah yeah <laughs> puerto rican new yorker yeah, yeah. And, and italian so mm-hmm. it's like it's all in there it's uh brooklyn it's you probably have the best food at every holiday oh absolutely oh. you don't get this big by accident <laughs> sweetheart i mean you know come on but yeah uh hearing about your experiences in new york like it's true it's a safe space for queers but like i had a very scary big puerto rican dad that you know kind of held me back in that respect but once you get out from under that then you you do what you got to do but I do love how that these legendary New York City queens had a hand in, in building you up. I think that's so fantastic. It, it, it's like even the stories we hear from the 80s. Like, we know the whole scene, like with Sherry Vine, Jackie Beat, uh, Mario Diaz, even, you know, Michael Alec, like, you know, mm-hmm. all of these kind of things. Um, but you were also studying at the same time this was going on. What were your best classes at AMDA? What were your worst classes? You're like, oh, girl, I just suck at that. So, I mean, my best classes, oh, God, I was just such a. I was not like super into AMDA, believe it or not. Um, I it's was, not for everybody. It's not. It's 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 like the Disneyland of where you want to study. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I I definitely had some things that I was strong at, but uh, when I was in when I was in AMDA, actually, um, I felt a lot of racial aggression, uh, in that um, all of the because ma- this was when you were eighteen. Yeah, this is when I was eighteen. It wasn't when Broadway was diverse the way it is yeah. now. <laughs> yeah, like they. You know, I bet you the cult- culture at AMDA is totally different. Totally different. Yeah, like when I went to school there, like if you were black, you got songs from black musicals. Wow. Yeah. It, it, like, like they let's do Dreamgirls. Yeah, we have they two were black like, kids. You should cut. I had shoulder length hair when I moved to New York, and they were like, "Did you really?" Mm-hmm, I, I have not seen one picture of that. Are those pictures <laughs> exist? I'm anywhere? mad that it doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> How <laughs> no, you look fierce? It, it was cute, and um, and uh, my uh, teachers convinced me that I needed to cut it um, because I wasn't marketable. Because you weren't castable. My hair looked too ethnic, is wow. what I was always told. You know, uh, which is something that a, a teacher would get fired for today. Yeah, hundred percent. You know, uh, at that time they were being smart for what Broadway was at the time and you probably couldn't get cast in every show. Yeah. Yeah. So it, so it, in AMDA like the I, I didn't like I didn't feel like I fully excelled in AMDA. I remember when I graduated my the head of my musical de- theater department came down the line to me and like my best friends we were all standing by each other and she goes one by one to each of them. She's like I hope you're ready for a super successful career. I, I know you're going to be on Broadway and then she gets to me and she's like I hope you're ready to keep working on your craft. Wow. And I was just like, she's actually here today. Please welcome her. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't she feel stupid right it's now? Real dumb. I mean, <laughs> you know, teachers have, have a, a tough job because they obviously want to prepare their students, especially in entertainment for the reality. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's like, come on, like, Let's break boundaries here. This is a chance to to inspire. Now, Broadway, like, look at the Into the Woods that uh, toured and that was so popular, was so uh, multiracial, so diverse, and it was so celebrated. It's like, yes, this is the point of mm-hmm. theater. Yeah, and then and the beautiful trans and non-binary actors who've been celebrated on Broadway mm-hmm. in recent years is awesome. Jay Harrison Gee winning a Tony. Yeah, like this, you know, like the world is changing there too. You know, so so do you think we need? And I want your opinion too. Do you think we need a non-binary? Um, category at the Tonys, at the Oscars, at the Emmys. Ooh. Are we at that point yet? Ah, wow. You know, because, you know, some actors have turned down their nominations because there's not a non binary. You know, it's really funny. I think the awards in general should just not be based on gender. Right. I was going to say just best actor, period. Yeah. Wait a minute, but that's if Hollywood roles were equal. We know there's great women roles, but we know a lot of the good roles are still going to men. And we know there are some men actors that are not the best actors, but they're the personalities. And God, I'm going to get hate email like <laughs> Robert De Niro, Al Pacino, even uh, Liam Neeson. These are good actors, but they're always doing their stuff. Mm-hmm. How can you compare that to, you know, like a Meryl Streep or an Olivia Coleman? It's like, I'm glad women have their own category because these women are 
they're working 200% because we know they're getting paid 80% or 60% of what the men are, are earning. Well, I feel like if the men can't compare, they just need to step their pussies up. But <laughs> I'm telling Robert De Niro, he's Ste- like, so step my pussy up. <laughs> <laughs> right. That was fresh. Okay, so let's talk about the New York scene. Like you talked about, and you know the New York scene, it, it is so difficult to actually break in mm-hmm. because it is very uh, clicky. It's very guarded for good reason. Mm-hmm. People worked hard to become big names in the nightlife. Mm-hmm. So when there's somebody new, it comes like, who the hell is that? Like, mm-hmm. take a nap, you know? How were you able to break into it in such a big way for your uh, Drag Race fans? Going to Drag Race was like, yeah, okay, this is a great blip on this huge career. But you came to Drag Race as this New York superstar. How were you able to break into that? And what set you apart from the other queens? I mean, the mentorship that I had, Sahara, uh, Deja Davenport, my drag mother. What what was it about you? Do you think that they were like, okay, we need to help this girl out. She's going to be a star. I mean, I'm that girl uh, <laughs> it, it wasn't just the booty it wasn't just the booty I mean I also slept my way to the top <laughs> good girl right I, I think that uh, I, I I think that my strongest attribute in nightlife is that I believe that our safe spaces that we've created are for people to have fun and I've always addressed my career and the things that I create with Will people have fun with this? Like, and I was always, uh, e- even if you didn't like my show, even if you didn't like my drag, I was just always such a good, fun person to be around. Like there were, you know, there was times where I had some questionable drag choices and, and I wasn't always great at makeup, you know, or whatever, but like I was a good time. My first parties in New York, I, I was booger the house down, but, they were filled with people who just wanted to experience my light, you know? Um, and I, I, I always acknowledge that. And so I've always made that the center of my focus. It was like, I always, I didn't necessarily want to be the most fashionable queen or I didn't necessarily need to have the most tricks and death drops, even though I can do them or whatever. I just wanted to make a persona that when everybody was around, they'd had a good time. And, and that was something that I experienced the first time I met Raja Gemini. And I, I, when I met Raja, I was like, that person, that energy, that's drag. You know, and so, uh, I, she's a hero of mine. I, I'm sure I've told her this over a glass of wine or 18. Um, <laughs> Girl, I drank with you on arenas so and you don't remember. Okay, right. <laughs> I remember uh, glimpses. <laughs> I got a glimpse, I'll tell you that. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> um, but right after college, you know, and uh, I had a terrible time in college too, because mm-hmm. I just never felt like. You know, I never got picked for anything. I was like, I can do that. I can do that. But I was, you know, I was the thicker kid. I was uh, Latino at like an almost all white school. And it's like, I just never got the chance. Mm-hmm. And it just gave me such disillusionment. And I was like, ugh, you know, fuck theater, fuck music, fuck all mm-hmm. that. And it's like, no. Um, and what you did was like kind of turn around. So right after college, you booked uh, the Broadway National Tour of Hairspray. Mm-hmm. As a young kid, touring in this great musical, going from city to city, I can imagine it was probably a double-edged sword. It's like, yes, you're learning your craft. You're in a Broadway national tour, but also like the naughty kid, like our eyes are open to boys across the nation, drinks across the nation, having the cloud of, I'm in a Broadway national tour. What did you learn most about yourself as an actor? And what kind of like fun mistakes did you make? You're like, oh, yeah, I shouldn't have done that, but I did. I mean, I was pretty much at the gay club in any city every time we checked in to the point that like on our tour schedule, they like always put uh, things in your itinerary, like good places to eat or whatever. And then like for me, it was like, and here's where the gay bar is (laughs) because I was 21 and I was going to get drunk and find some wang. Okay, (laughs) I was. How did you show up on time for all your stuff? For the most part, I did. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> okay, so is that where some of the mistakes you made? You're like, you didn't for, make a performance. For, for sure. And we know Hairspray's not like a quiet show. You could just no. like sit in the back. You're like, 
Right. There was one time that I was definitely <laughs> fully full hungover. Didn't think I was going on. And in Good Morning Baltimore, one of the houses that comes out hit a guy's foot. And then like I got a call like, you're going to the stage right now and get in your costume. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm like, I can't tell if I'm lit or if I'm hungover. <laughs> And I butchered that show so hard. I'm so sorry to everybody who's in the cast that night. Like I, I was in the wrong spot during the whole Welcome to the Sixties. Like you were in the seventies, and they were in the sixties. Yeah, Yeah. literally had to have like a conversation with Actors Equity after. (laughs) Is that true? Yeah, yeah. They were like, you've been written up. Like you could be kicked out of the union. Like kind of stuff. Like that's so that's entirely true. What I love is that you're able to share this. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of people like, oh, you know, I made my mistakes or whatever. This is the reality when you're young and you get your first big opportunity is you can fuck it up because the allure of the nightlife. Life is great. The allure of the sex life, mm-hmm. uh, drugs, alcohol, it all plays even when you come to West Hollywood and, you know, but it can affect the whole future of your career. And I'm glad that you shared that. It's yeah. a funny story, but we can learn from that. Too. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely snapped me together and got me together and, and helped me focus and prioritize what's important, you know, and then I became a drag queen because drinking and sex are important. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> <laughs> their job skills their, their right. tricks of the trade <laughs> now growing up in New York were you like a Broadway boy did you see like all the Broadway shows or no not really that wasn't your uh, scene no I mean I just, a gay man not into Broadway I know I discovered it kind of I mean they used to do this uh, Broadway um, kind of fair on 42nd Street where you could like get tickets for free like it was a raffle because (laughs) not any free tickets today that's what i mean broadway always was and still is ridiculously expensive so it kind of wasn't in my price range growing up so that's why maybe i would have liked it but you know this is my biggest complaint about broadway now we have diverse casting now we're telling stories from independent you know it's not just a sondheim show it's not just a andrew lloyd weber show and people can't afford to see it no the fact that Hamilton kind of set the bar is like, this is the new Broadway. We're going to look at characters a totally different way. We're going to look at casting a different way. But you won't be able to afford it. It's so ridiculous. I know. To me. Merely, we roll along. Um, tickets are $400. Wow. Yeah. yeah. $400. Like, who can afford that? Mm. I remember when I moved to New York, my theater teacher telling me, he was like, if you live in New York and you don't go to see Broadway shows, why are you here? And I just thought that was the most elitist yeah. piece of bullshit ever. I was like, babe, I eat off the dollar menu every day. Like, how? <laughs> that's because I live in New York. <laughs> so let's talk about your off-Broadway experience. Um, the Electric Highway and the Orion Experience, both sci-fi type of pieces. Why sci-fi? I don't know. I think that I've always been out of this world. <laughs> well, we've all seen Uranus. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, I, I wrote the Electric Highway. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, it was with your group, with my with my band. Yeah. Um, and I'm. I met the Orion Experience when recording with my band, and I actually still to this day tour with the Orion Experience. I'm actually going to London with them next week. Uh, and we just opened up a new tour in LA on Saturday, the, the, the one that's going to London. But you let a bitch know. Right? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, th- yeah, and o- Orion uh, from the Orion Experience has always been a musical collaborator with me. Uh, we wrote uh, worship me together. He wrote a song called Trouble for Me. Uh, and, uh, so we've always been, re- been really close. And when, uh, he, when they, when they started, uh, their show, The Orion Experience, I actually met him because I was doing karaoke at a little bar called No Parking <laughs> in Washington Heights, which is the first gay bar in Washington Heights that I helped open with them. Um, when it would, we had to like literally run home from the bar because that's not a, that wasn't a place to open a gay bar. And now it's completely genderfied. That, that bar is now the Planet Fitness. Um, but, God, wow. but, but, uh, but yeah, uh, that karaoke host, uh, Travis Geisler was, uh, directing this musical and he's going on to assist and direct big, huge Broadway projects and everything. And he called me, he was like, I have this role for you. She is a vampire sorceress alien queen Ooh, that's up your alley I'm into and, it. Yeah, and I, I was just like hey I, 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 let's go you know yeah. um and yeah it's it it's always been that but i've also always seen because my experiences in life always felt so othered i've always seen honey as that as well like i've i've, I've never been trying to 
do exactly what's happening, but always in my own lane. So of course people would see that as some something otherworldly. Now, performing off Broadway is you know, that's an experience because as an actor, from what I've heard, you're able to really like explore. It's not like the pressure of Broadway, we gotta hit mm-hmm. everything, like you're able to explore. You also did Trinkets, uh, which is about the lives of transsexual sex workers in Manhattan's meatpacking district in the nineties. Um not the big sci-fi type musical. No. You played uh, Diva, a veteran prostitute. Um, what was it like to kind of take all of the pageantry away, so to speak, and then work on a role like this in a in a pretty sobering show? Yeah, it was it was it, the, the beautiful thing about Trinkets is it was written by Paul Alexander, who's lived in the meatpacking district by the transgender, you know, whole stroll for 25, 30 years, maybe. Um, queer icon, part of the ones wrote, uh, for George Michael, like everybody, you know, like huge. Uh, he just had this like wealth of knowledge. And so I would hang out with him all the time and like, uh, discover stories from the past and I like, actually meet some former girls and it, It was really cool because I had all of that acting training. And so for the first time, I was not putting on this like, I'm a vampire sex queen. I was like, oh, I can play real people and have like intimate heart to heart moments. And and, and that helped my drag in so many ways because it, it gave me the ability to deliver a, a, a real message that people can sometimes relate to better than over-the-top sci-fi queen. And it kind of brought you back to your early beginnings, mm-hmm. talking about social injustice as a kid. Mm-hmm. I know your mom like helped you rap through some of your stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so to kind of come back and strip that away, it's like, yeah, this is where our community comes from. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, growing up, my mom, I was I was a little quiet, and I just didn't know how to express myself. Well, that changed. <laughs> but hello, right? <laughs> and my mom, uh, in the 80s and 90s, she used to, like, she was, like, kind of a tomboy, and she would, like, stand on the corner and like rap with her friends and they would freestyle and so she would do that occasionally with me and I kind of like got good at it as a kid we would do it like walking home from school and it was something she realized that I really enjoyed so when she would try to get me to speak about my feelings to her or tell her what was going on in my life she'd be like all right how about this you can curse you can say anything you want to as long as it rhymes how smart is that like you know she used she used it to break me out of my box and and Cut to I'm writing songs for me in Alaska. You know, like, yeah, yeah. that's amazing. Thanks. Now, you did go through this shift. Honey was kind of androgynous and she became more feminine. Mm-hmm. What was that shift? Uh, like, what was it? Was that just your evolution of drag or what was that shift about? I think that I think that the beginnings of my drag were me trying to discover my like actual identity mm-hmm. um, and the more I became clear and comfortable with my gender expression, the more I wanted Honey to be a woman. And I was like, <laughs> you know, the more the more I out of drag as Honey, because I always go by Honey, out of drag and in drag, and the more out of drag that I felt secure enough to be myself, the, th- the, the things that I would, used to wear on stage... That was what I wanted to wear to the grocery store for real. Like, you know, like, <laughs> I was like, but now what do I want to wear on stage? If I want to wear that to the grocery store, I was like, okay, now I want to wear a gown on stage. Like, you know, and I, and, and I, uh, I started to explore that more. Um, and I, I started to explore pageantry more. I really, my, my first pageant was Miss Stonewall and I really, really wanted to be Miss Stonewall because of what it means for our queer history. Mm. And I lost that pageant three times before winning it on my fourth, because I did win. Um, <laughs> and you have many crowns, 18 crowns, right? 19 now. Oh, 19 oh. crowns, bitch. The current reigning Miss Southern California oh, Continental. Oh, okay. Where do you keep all your crowns? Like when you walk in, is it are they all just like all there? So I used to in New York, and then, oh my gosh, she's going to be so mad about this. When I went to Drag Race, my partner... Um, there we go. Look at that. <laughs> yeah, that's my current title. She's when polished, I, girl. Wow. When I went to Drag Race... Um, I, I had a whole bunch of stuff at my former assistant's house and my partner was tasked with getting it all back into my storage unit because obviously my drag couldn't fit in my tiny New York apartment. So he had to get everything back into my storage unit and he set boxes of things on top of my 
box of crowns. Oh. Crushing most of them. Oh, no. Oh, I still have all the shattered pieces. Don't worry. Um, and I hope one That's day. That's something about your up. next EP is shattered pieces. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> um, and, and, and he, he broke all of them. So I don't have, I don't have many of them still intact. Uh, but, um, but I still have all of the titles and, you the know. The memories live on. Yeah. And a plastic crown doesn't make you a queen. So. True. I love that. That is true. I love that. That was fresh. We're not going to talk too much about Drag Race because you've been interviewed about Drag Race over and over and over. But I want I want your fans and I want our audience to really know how you came to Drag Race. You were almost homeless. Mm -hmm. Um, You had to borrow money from people to put your looks together to even get there. You were coming to the show with a lot of stress. Yeah. You were also coming to the show with this huge resume already. It's Mm -hmm. like, yes, I'm doing the show, but... Do I need the show to make me mean? Nope. Whereas some queens we know, it's like, if I don't do this, then I'm, it's just not going to happen for me. Yeah. Can you talk about kind of that preparation where you've got this dichotomy of financial? And, and I hate the fact, I mean, I love that drag has become so commercial, but I also do not like the fact that if you don't have money, you, it's, it's almost, and I hate to say it, yeah. it's almost impossible to break in. Mm hmm. That has changed because there used to be drag queens that would put on a garbage bag and they'd be Barbara Streisand because they'd be inventive. Mm-hmm. I think our creativity has kind of decreased as the commercialism has increased because now we have stylists that make mm-hmm. us who we are. Anyway, that's a rant. Can you talk a little bit about how you kind of gathered that courage knowing that like, God, I'm not in a good place in my life, but I'm going to go ahead and film this reality show. And you auditioned eight times, right? Yeah, I... See, the thing is, before I was a thing, I was auditioning. I had a conversation with Sahara before she passed. Um, and I was, I had submitted the tape and I was considering submitting more, thinking that maybe I was getting to a place where I might not need it and you know, whatever. And, uh, one, and our, our very last conversation was, don't you ever, not take an opportunity. She was like, this is just an opportunity. This is a billboard for your drag. This is just a springboard for everything you got going on. Um, and I, even though I was in the place that I was in in New York, I'd still occasionally go up for like a movie role or a theater role. And they were like, uh, well, we're not going to put you in it because, uh, we have Bob the drag queen who was just on drag race and they're getting this role. So I, I definitely felt, uh, like there was a ceiling that I wasn't going to break without signing up for that program and it it definitely came in the hardest time one of the hardest times of my life i was i was homeless uh you know i my marriage which i've been happily married for 12 for 10 years together with him for 12 uh we were we were on the rocks um (laughs) and (laughs) but the fact that you're open and you talk about this you know there's no relationship that's perfect Mm -hmm. that relationships are hard work and i know you guys kind of have like a long distance yeah relationship and on top of all of that i was struggling with a huge cocaine addiction before i did not know that yeah um and i just didn't know a way out um and i and i i had actually before season 11 told myself after my audition tape for season 10, that that was like it. I gave it the try. I was fine. I was done. I wasn't going to get on it. And I love my life and I love my career. And I was going to go ahead about my things. And then I got a call and they were like, Hey, are you not submitting a tape for season 11? And I was like, they had you pissed. Yeah. And I was like, no, I'm not going to submit a tape this season. Cause I've, I've literally poured my life into making these 20 minute audition <laughs> tapes. By the way, they're super easy now. They're not even as hard as they were. They changed them right after my season. It was only going to be challenging for me. It's cause Whatever. some drag queens don't know how to. Yeah, all, anyway, all that. Yeah. Uh, so I was like, no, I'm not going to do it. I just gonna give myself a year off. And then the casting director goes, Hmm. That's such a bad idea. This could have been your turn. Wow. And the fact that they picked up the phone and like called, called me. you. I was like, what are you, what are you calling me for? Okay, fine. I'll make a tape in the season, my season 11 tape. I promise you, I made that shit in two nights. There was zero thought really put behind it. I just was like, whatever. If you're calling me, you must want me. Yeah. So let me yeah. just give you me. And it was honest. It was the most honest thing that I ever did. And it taught me a really valuable lesson. Sometimes our best entertainment, sometimes our best activism, sometimes our best leadership comes when we're just existing. When we allow ourselves to just like say I'm enough. Mm. I, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. You know, there's a large number of our community that is not part of the entertainment community. Like they're leading their normal lives mm-hmm. and they're being their, you know, mm-hmm. authentic self. I think as 
commercial, even with our LGBTQ uh, programming, even Bros the Movie, and I don't want to get any more <laughs> hate email. It's like, I think we've lost that kind of sincerity and that kind of what makes us us. It's like, okay, commercial, commercial, what's going to sell? Mm-hmm. And I think it's because of TikTok. It's because of Instagram. It's like, what hashtags are going to sell? What one-liners are going to sell? Yeah, and it's I, like, we're real people. I mm-hmm. would even say even the most successful girls off of Drag Race, they're the most authentic. Look at Sasha Colby. She was 150% that is Sasha Colby. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, Bob the Drag Queen. Mm-hmm. And, all the winners, they were themselves. So, like, the prepackaged girls, and don't get me wrong, I'm a fan of the show. I love it. You know, whatever. Yeah, 100% fan of the show. We have many of them on the show all the time. But, yeah. you know, like, I mean, I saw Miss Coco Peru this weekend. Talk about legendary. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? I saw Shakita, like, last year. Last year, she doesn't age. I can't, mm. like, she, it, like... I know, right? You know, Varla Jean Merman, I sh- saw her this summer. These are the these are the girls that the kids don't know about and don't yeah. care to know about, which is sad because it's, it's not just who's presented on the TV show as much as I love it and I'm a fan of it. So, like, no shade, but... You know. I wish Drag Race would do one episode where they bring in icons like that to mentor... Coco actually mentioned that she was like yeah. they don't, don't they want do us that? she was like they are 16 seasons in they do not want us just Lady Bunny for the comedy of like her and Rue like doing yeah. drugs in the East Village together that's the only reason that's probably like, why Rue was like well, I don't need any of the stories you know but um, it, it, I had read is it true that Rue gave you your name yeah I am a, it was a mistake right it was a mistake <laughs> talk about it this is a really fun story so I was it was, it, it was uh, at a book signing uh, and I was I had a dance group called the Hunties that yep. I had developed after Dancing with Peppermint um, and I hadn't really broken into drag but me and my good friend like a brother Antoine we would uh, dance back up for Sherry Vine and Peppermint and Shaquita and everyone yep. and we were like the Hunties we were marketing ourselves as that and I went to a book signing and I asked her to sign my book to the Hunties and you know Grandma Paul <laughs> didn't hear me straight <laughs> and she signs this book you know, to honey. And a week later, my my friend who I had this group with, he decides, "Mm, maybe I want to focus more on my musical theater career and drag's not necessarily, or working for drag queens is not necessarily the direction I want to go. And I was like, I respect that, totally cool. But this club is calling and they got $500 for us. And I need this $500. So I'm going to take that. You cannot. And I called her back. I was like, yeah, I'll be there. And I'll have tons of backup dancers. And I got routines and yada, yada, yada. And they go, well, if you're not the hunties, then who are you? And I'm looking at this book. And I was like, oh, I'm just honey. That's great. I mean, that's like, that's history writing itself. Yeah. And that's like destiny writing itself. Mm -hmm. I don't have a story like that. I know. Like, can I just put Alex? I'm like, Alexander. <laughs> <laughs> um, so part of being your authentic self, and we're going to talk about this because it's such a hot topic. You've never shied away from your sexuality. No, we've seen your booty. Uh, you had you had a fans account. Uh, I haven't had an OnlyFans account yet. No, you've had a drag for fans. Drag for fans, but it was. It was more dragged in for... We saw stuff. Okay. <laughs> we know you might be on Grinder sometimes. Always. <laughs> we might know you might have been with some of my friends or some of the fans that emailed us. Ooh. Ooh. Nobody has a complaint, by the way. I'll tell you that. Well, Because right. mm-hmm. sometimes I'll get, oh, they have like a weird dick or something. I'm like, I didn't get one of those emails. And just so you know, bears love honey. Okay. I, I was going to say, I see some of that fur. <laughs> Everybody loves honey. honey. I okay. was like, uh, you know. Nina Garden loves honey. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you can't buy organic store bots okay <laughs> so but i want to know um the whole drag community is under attack yeah for being uh, sexual perverts and that we're grooming children should we still be celebrating our sexuality in such a visible way when the conserv and i'm playing devil's advocate by the way mm-hmm. when because this is the comment that people are saying when the conservative communities are just waiting for us to make a wrong move um, should sexuality still be such a big part of the drag community? Well, two things. A, I'm a good person and I trust myself, so I don't think that any of my sexual desires are uh, are an abomination or anything wrong. And because all of mine are with consenting adults, uh, and and as much as I've always uh, preached. Uh, 
sexual liberation I've always that that's always been something that it's very much on the forefront of everything that I have to say about that I don't even necessarily like kids um, <laughs> well I want to know like, <laughs> let's just be honest can't stand them uh, like a friend of mine asked me uh, do you know any black teenagers who I can invite to this screening I was like I don't know any teenagers period. I don't hang out with teenagers I don't, I don't know. know any teenagers I don't know anyone at all that this, like that's not you know no um, so I, I think I think it's important to still uh, to still be sexual as well because a, a huge part of the queer liberation movement is that our sexuality is not wrong and the reality of the fact is that every single person you pass on the streets every single day of your life was created from sex it's the least weird thing in this world and everybody's watched porn by the way everybody's watched oh, porn I hope I mean no, but everybody literally has watched porn yeah if you haven't that's really fucking sad yeah I can imagine. I mean, there's probably some people. There might be somebody who hasn't listened to Renaissance. <laughs> <laughs> well, even like with Bear World Magazine, you guys have partnered with there's there's a sexy side coming or it's yeah, there. Um, we'll be working with uh, Bear Magazine, which was the big uh, magazine in the um, 80s and 90s that kind of gave like birth to the, the bear culture or whatever. So it's changed hands a few times um and now we'll be sharing content with them and them with us but in a family friendly way um but you know uh it'll be revamped to, to reflect the time so you know more diverse uh you know um body types more diverse people period because bear was really good at featuring like muscly white guys you know so um we're already like you know um working with them to feature you know different ethnicities different races um and different body types so you know it's important and just like while we're on the topic of grooming you know it, it's interesting that they're going after drag queens it's just like you know how about why when, drag queens that's what i don't understand it's an easy target i think and then like you know with kids they're like oh is that your girlfriend when it's like a little boy and a little girl playing together that's grooming you know what mm-hmm. i'm saying it's like why are you sexualizing a play date between two two-year-olds like and we're talking about like a drag performer showing their ass right whereas every pg-13 movie when i was growing up had tits in it definitely i'm like how is that not and, and that's dra- okay and drag queens are not inviting your fucking children to the show right yes. they probably don't like want them. you know it's like you're trying to live your fantasy like leave the kids at home then like yeah <laughs> now am i right in thinking that the drag community is embracing their sexuality more we're seeing more and more drag queens um even from the drag race family show more skin do more provocative videos mm-hmm. kind of celebrate like yeah this is my ass this is my bulge this is like right it, 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 that's happening right i i agree yeah i think that it's a side effect of um it, of what RuPaul created and that she would always be, have a presence in and out of drag. And so when Drag Race started, there were a lot of queens. You, you, you never got to see Peppermint out of drag. Most people haven't ever seen Lady Bunny out of drag. It looks like the Quaker Oats man. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is not a lie. It's not a lie. It's not a lie. Uh, <laughs> you know, like, but, but, but drag queens, when I was growing up in New York City, drag queens didn't go out, out of drag. Yeah. It wasn't some, you know, like, it, it wasn't even a thing. And, uh, what Drag Race did was it started to celebrate uh, some of our actual real life personas as well. And I know for me, one of the biggest embraces I've gotten from the show, not just, you know, my drag or my skills, but like I, when I walked back on screen with a beard, I got celebrated as you know a person outside of drag yeah. and getting that validation and celebration it, it created a space for us to then be like oh bitch i'm hot because there was a time in our history and i'm sure we know i'm 38 years old where like screwing a drag queen was like a Ugh, no mm-hmm. dating a drag queen was a or it was no. a fetish Right. Or it, it was, was a an fetish. extreme fetish. It's like, don't take the wig off. It's like, yeah, oh, oh but I'm this person. <laughs> and now with with what Drag Race has created, we've become rock stars. Yeah, mm-hmm. we're modern day rock stars. Um, and and that's always had a sexual, in, you know, 100%. for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so let's talk about Mighty Legendary, mm-hmm. your partnership with Hey Mister, which, which you know, it's an online resource for prep. If you're not on prep, get on prep. It's so easy. They couldn't make it um, easier. Um, 
How did this opportunity come about? What was it like working with Alaska? Because I've heard different things about working with Alaska. Really? Yeah. So Alaska is really cool. I think she's super cool and down to earth um, or or whatever, down to whatever planet she's from. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, I've always had a really easy time hanging out with her. Um, my first Christmas in L.A., my friend, photographer friend, David Loff, took me to a Christmas party at Bitch Pudding's house from Dragula. We and, love Bitch Pudding. Right? Oh, yeah. yeah. And Alaska was there. And that's when I first met Alaska. Uh, and we talked and she was chill. She wasn't like weird or anything. Like, you know, I had just done drag race and she was like chill and normal. And uh, then I think there was like a night at like precinct where she, she was, it was, she was performing, Jackie Beat was performing, and Sherry Vine was performing, and I was DJing, and we were in the That's dressing like, room. That's like, this is like, if you are new to the drag scene, like, this is Icon Night. Right, right? it yeah. was Icon Night, right. down. That was fresh. And we were in the, uh, we were in the dressing room, and I was like, oh yeah, I want to come see whatever show you're doing. She was like, okay, text me. And I was like, text you? Like, bitch, I ain't got your number. And she goes, in the dressing room, she says, Honey Davenport should have my phone number and leaves. Right? <laughs> so somebody That's like gave a me a challenge. It's like, let's see you ride to the room, and figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, somebody gave me her number. And, you know, I've always taken that friendship very. Uh, kindly because um, I, I I admire her work and I've never wanted our friendship to be about work because that could easily be seen as me trying to ride a hotel or something like it's that. It's so hard to make friends when you are who you are, when she is who she is right. because it's like, do they like me? Do they want to just step up? Right. Yeah. I, I, I always had that feeling. I'm, I, I, I text pretty closely with Trixie and I'm always like I want to ask Trixie to do something with me like artistically like give a discount on her $500 a night hotel Whoa. Well, I, well, well, I mean it's worth <laughs> it I mean it's worth it I don't it. get a Broadway show I get a thrift store that I gotta it's pay more money for I shit. love the Trixie Motel I've never left I'm joking sober. of course but <laughs> um, you don't even I, get like a show I'm not I love you Trixie but girl come on <laughs> and she's like buy my merch $40 for right. an eyelash but I've, I've always struggled with like do you ask your friends who are successful and in some cases more successful than you to create with you? But I like create every day. So like, yeah. yeah. Um, and so I was texting with Alaska after I wrote the original version of Mighty Legendary. Like, hey, what do you think of this track? And I was, I was, and funny story, I was sitting with David Laugh as I was doing it. I was te- texting her, what do you think of it? And she's like, oh my gosh, this is really good. And then David was like, you should just ask her to be on the remix. And I was like, ooh, I don't want to cross that line. I don't want to cross that boundary. But then I was just like, but why not? Right. Because you don't ever want your friends to feel used. But if they're your friends, they're not going to feel used. Yeah. Unless you're not being a sincere friend to begin right, with. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, and, and that was the response I got from her. It was like, Oh, hell yeah. Like, when do you want to do it? What do you want to do? And I was like, okay, well, I want to do this and I want to do that. And so when I got her in a studio and, you know, I, I originally was like, well, would you like to write your verse? And, uh, you know, she's a super busy woman. And so I said, would you like to write a verse in this song? And she's like, yeah, I'll be on your song. And I'm like waiting, waiting, waiting for a verse back. And I never got a verse back. And so it's like a day before we're going into the studio. And I was like... Bitch, I'm about to write this verse in the style of Alaska. <laughs> and so I was like, Plus, I'm gonna... you know rap. You've been doing it since you were a kid. Right. And I know Alaska. Yeah. So, cause I've known her, you know, for a very long time before we ever created something together. Uh, and so, and so I did. And, um, once I had Alaska on the track, um, the opportunities really opened up for me because, uh, I was able to get, you know, the music video, which was a dream come true made by Ron Kadagiri, um, it's a director who I've been wanting to work with again since he made it looks gorgeous thank you he also made love is god with me in manila and uh i i'm still paying for that video it was so expensive <laughs> i was like i was like i don't ever think i can do this again and he was like oh you know as long as you know we find you some kind of sponsorship then you can make it happen and i was like well we have to find sponsorship from somebody who i want to align myself with in the queer community yep and mr is that i actually recently last week switched over to getting my prep from mr because i traveled too much to like go it's in. so easy you guys yeah it's so easy you can prick your finger right in your bathroom boom 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 and then it's like and then boom 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 and you're good and then you we, can boom 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 and you can boom 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 <laughs> they are doing great things i didn't know that they were aligned 
intertwined with that, they're also a sponsor of the Bear World Magazine Awards. So yeah. They, they're really jumping in on all different parts of the community. So that's amazing. I, I said to someone earlier this week, I said, it's really cool because they're not only saving our bodies, you know, uh, but they're also stepping in and helping further our art and our media and our presence in the world. So, like, they're stopping, helping us stop from dying. Yeah. And helping us live. And they're taking cool. the stigma away in a yeah. fun way that we can communicate. It's like, we have gay sex. We just do. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> just like everybody just has sex. Yeah. Um, well, I love it. So what does Mighty Legendary mean? Like, what's 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 the theme of the song? So here's how it came about. I wanted to do a pageant. I hadn't done a pageant in a very long time. And your crowns were in smithereens. You're like, like, I need some replacements. I want a new one. Oh, my God. Um, And I had talked to the legendary pageant queen, Fantasia L'Amour, who lives out here in California. And I was like, one of these days, I'm going to go back to Continental. I'm going to compete for Continental again. And she was like, if you ever want to go to Continental, you better come to my prelim. And I was like... Yeah, why why am I saying one of these dates? Why do not why yeah. don't I do it now? So Say I, yes. Right. right. So I started prepping for my prelim and I had everything in line. I had my gown finished, I had my dancers and my talent. I had hotel rooms booked and everything. To the point that I almost had no more money left. And then my agent calls me and he's like I have this booking for you in Pennsylvania the night before for more money than you've ever made. Oh. And I was like Okay, so I guess I'm pulling out of the pageant because there's no way I could, you know, come from random bubblefuck Pennsylvania and get to San Diego in time for this pageant at 11 a.m. the Ooh. next day. So how am I going to do that? And, um, you know, everybody was just like, well, if you could do it, that would be really sickening. And I was like, yeah, that would be like really fucking legendary to like just get off a plane and win a pageant. And so I well, it is three hours ahead, right? Yeah. I was just, like, I'm thinking of the math right, right now. Right? I'm just like, it's possible. I had to get on a tiny little plane to to Washington D.C. and then a bigger plane, and I landed in San Diego. The interview was starting at eleven thirty. I landed at eleven fifteen. Oh, oh my god. god! I didn't even get my suitcases and bags out of the airport. My best friend in the whole entire world, Safira Cristal, picked me up in my car at the airport with my suit pressed for interview. Oh. I jumped in the car. I put on my suit. I went to interview. I won the entire pageant. And the only thing I kept saying oh, after wow. the pageant was, "That was so legendary. That was very, very legendary." <laughs> <laughs> and I just kept saying that for days, and then I was like, "That's a song, yeah, that's a song," you know. What I'm saying? And 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 you know, and it was something Zafira said to me. She was like, "You know, they kind of already call you the legendary Honey Davenport. Do something fucking legendary, like get off a plane and win a pageant, bitch." And and I did. You're like done, well, done. <laughs> wow. That's a crazy story. That yeah. is that's crazy. also a good friend. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, your friends should do for you what you are willing to do for them. I mean, mm-hmm. that's a really good friend. Yeah. I'm thinking of now who would do that for me, and I'm like maybe three people that are my friends. <laughs> well, we had a plan too, and that uh, she was she wanted to compete for a pageant in New Jersey called Miss Paradise, and uh, I have won Miss Paradise, uh, and so I was like, all right, bet we had already had that set in line too. Safira already had a plane ticket to come over here, uh, and, and you know that was already going to happen, and I was like, all right, I will fly to Jersey. I will help you and dress you and get you ready for your pageant. There we go. And you will fly to San Diego and you'll help me and dress me and get me ready for my pageant. We'll tag team it all together. At just about everything that I've done in my career since I met Safira Cristal has gone through her ears. And just about everything that she's done in her career since she met me has gone through me. This is my best friend in the whole world. And we really hold each other to a really high standard. We don't let each other give up. Yeah, you know, is she from Philly? Good. By the she way, she is from Philly. I've seen her perform. She is one of mine and Richard's absolute favorite drag. Performers. She's one of the best drag queens in oh, the entire world. Oh my god! Yeah, and I was just like, <laughs> Richard's gonna be so excited. <laughs> and I heard you really, guys, you really do give it all with your tag teaming. Uh, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, we used to call that the sister sandwich back in the day. And oh, oh man, only a few people who have ever gotten that experience, and if they survive, they can't walk the now. Day, yeah, right? no, they're, they're like, oh, I'm in a wheelchair now. <laughs> um, okay, so we we have to wrap up, but uh, I want to throw it back. You know, we're ha- entering Halloween season, and with Stan the Mechanic, I want to know what your favorite horror films are, um, and the gayest part of them are. So Stan the Mechanic, since, you know, you're the expert, like, what are your top two favorite 
My top two, fa- well, my favorite of all time is Halloween 1978, but I'm going to choose other ones because that is too, like, on the nose. So if you're looking for good. But if, but if that's it, then, then I mean, that's it. That's it. But in terms of queerness, they didn't introduce any queerness until Halloween Kills, which just came out two years ago. So you and- don't think Michael Myers, like, with the flawless skin and, like, he just, you maybe know, he's, maybe uh, he's a loner. His big knife, like, I don't know, his big <laughs> phallic knife. But um, <laughs> one great queer horror film that I've seen is something called Death Drop Gorgeous. And I keep shouting them out. Uh, it's streaming on Shudder. It's an independent film um, with guys that are, are bearish, but it's a drag queen serial killer movie. Ooh. So, yes, um, starring uh, the, the the queen is Miss Gloria Hole, and I traveled to P-Town just to meet Peyton St. James oh, and played I, her. I, yeah, okay. I, I um, that. And she's on a quest for eternal youth, and that comes with the blood of, like, you know, the twinks that are hanging out at the clubs in Providence, Rhode Island. So if you haven't seen that, that's a good one for this uh, Halloween season. Yeah. I mean, if you can get eternal use from Twinks, I'm never aging. Honey. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you have to like sit and have dinner with them and they're like, oh, that's, uh, that's the most painful no, part. She right? just kills them. So, you know, yeah, thank yeah, God. Relatable. I mean, they're like, uh, did you watch MTV this week? No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I literally went on a date recently and they didn't know who Judy Garland was. And I was just like, mm. we're, and I, we're I, done. Yeah. And we're done. Check. <laughs> okay, so mine is Exorcist and Midsummer, and you're gonna be like, "Well, they're not queer films." Exorcist is so queer. Mm-hmm. We have the hot priest who's trying to find his identity. He's affixed to his mom, and then I mean, Regan when she gets all possessed is pretty queer in that she's like shouting out like sassy one-liners, mm-hmm. and she's reading them for filth. <laughs> it's and then we have Ellen Burstyn who is a huge diva in my mind. She's like she's like a gay. So I think it's I think it's pretty gay. Mm-hmm. And then midsummer, we have all the pageantry. Oh. We have the colors. We have it's pretty gay. And then the one guy when that scene when he's like sleeping with—I mean, that's hot. You know, there's just this whatever. So, so that's my yeah. strong choices. Oh my gosh, I don't. Know. Okay, so I I I do love horror movies. I enjoy them. I I haven't like really invested in them to like know I love them. I love them. Uh, know a whole bunch. And this is gonna seem super cliche, but like I can't tell you how many thousands of times I've watched The Craft. Like, it, it, okay. Okay. 100%. Did you watch the reboot? I Which did was not. made by and for the queer community, by the way. Oh, I did not watch that. Is it good? God, I, even I didn't I don't want to say anything. That. I'm sorry. I, because I heard such bad things about it. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything more because I don't want to. <sighs> I um, also really like it was literally made by our community for our community. Oh wow. So we need to go check it out. It's very queer. It, it's not good. <laughs> oh. oh, that sucks. But the craft is so gay. The craft is so, so gay. gay. It's so right. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, I, I also I like mean, Nancy. I mean, she's uh, like a lesbian icon. She's everybody's queer. Like, the gays wanted to be her. The girls wanted to sleep with her. Like, yeah. And if you've ever seen Morgan McMichaels, Nancy from fucking. Oh, they're the same yeah. person. Oh. Same. Especially after he's had a few to drink. Oh, gosh. Person, like, <laughs> you cannot bind me. <laughs> oh. We've been trying to for yeah. some time. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very queer film, though. Yeah. But it had to deal with, like, finding your identity and who are you and mm-hmm. you can be your own. I love that. All right, guys. Um, oh, I have still pages of uh, questions we got. This is how it happens on On the Rocks. Okay. Um, tell everybody where they can find and follow you, John Hernandez. Yes. Please follow up uh, um, at Bear World Mag on uh, Insta and Twitter, please. And uh, my personal account related to that is at John underscore BWM. And if you want. Not that you can tag you or message you or anything. Uh, uh, she exclusive. She is. Yeah, but right? uh, no, <laughs> no, that's all changing. And then if you want to check out my horror hosting stuff, it's standthemechanic.com and at standthemechanic on Instagram and Twitter. And it's so fun. Mm-hmm. All right. Honey, honey. <laughs> well, you can find me at Honey Davenport Official on Instagram and Facebook and YouTube, where which is a, a deep, dark hole into my brain. I'm not going to make a joke with that. <laughs> um, and you can find me on X or whatever Twitter has become, even though I don't want to align myself to Elon Musk, uh, uh, at uh, honey underscore Davenport, only because occasionally you can see under my clothing. 
Oh. Yes, you can. It's quite popular. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, well, gentlemen, gentle people. Thank you. Yes. Um, what a fun show. We didn't even get to cover so much. <laughs> um, but there's so much, so many facets to you. And I'm glad that, you know, fans are discovering that and that you're working so hard. You really establish your brand outside of Drag Race. Like I, like I said, Drag Race is, is a fun, point mm-hmm. and that's it but and you have this whole other yeah yep. if you're smart enough for any queen thinking about auditioning for drag race or any queen who might be doing it or whatever just use it as um as a, a trampoline i'm like super thankful that rupaul has created a uh, opportunity for us to be seen but that that's not what's legendary about me what's yes. legendary about me is all of the things that i did with that increase she gave to my career love it love it love it love it all right uh that's all folks it's always a grab bag of fun here every weekend on the rocks big thank you to our engineer tony sweet our social media clip editor alexis mendez we tape this at ubn go studios for all of your podcast needs please like share subscribe so we can continue bringing this fabulous program Programming coming your way for free. Um, until next time, stay happy, stay uh, healthy, stay sexy, and if you drink, stay tipsy. Except Shannon Bador. <laughs> <laughs> this has been another episode of On the Rocks. Tweet me and slide into my DMs on Twitter and Instagram at On the Rocks On Air. Find everything On the Rocks for free at ontherocksradioshow.com. Subscribe, like, review, and share. Until next week, stay fabulous. Thank <laughs> you.